All right, so to talk to us, we have Thomas Reyes Cairo, our product production manager with us today. Thanks for joining us, Thomas. Happy and I'll go here. ahead and turn the time over to you. Excellent, great. So um, basically, I'm gonna be spending most of my time working in the uh, tool that we've built our latest micro learning courses in. Um, it is the Domino Flow tool. Um, and it's uh, pretty new to us, but we're really excited to be using it. It's uh, fantastic for the purposes of what we were hoping to accomplish in building our new micro learning. Uh, yeah, so again, uh, Domino Flow is uh, kind of our, our, our big first choice for this because it's, it's a really fantastic tool for building um, mobile uh, responsive learning and also um, accessible learning. Uh, it's, it's really uh, very easy to set up uh, with screen readers. Uh, it has a very uh, nice way that it handles mobile content that's a little bit different than some of the other authoring tools that are out there and available. And we just really like it a lot uh, and have uh, learned to use it and, and take advantage of some of these benefits. And so um, I, I don't know that I'm necessarily going to talk too much about that. That's kind of more like a, a, a let's talk about Domino's sort of a webinar, which I think we, we have one in our webinar archive. We might have had them come over and guest and, and talk a little bit about things. So check that out if you're interested in that. But um, more specifically, we're going to be talking about our courses, how you can go about editing them, uh, which is going to be a little bit uh, more tool-centered. And so we'll, we'll probably dive into that a little bit. When, when we talk about um, editing and customizing courses, uh, there's usually kind of just a, a small group of things uh, that we tend to focus on for that. And so that's that's kind of where we're going to aim. So we're going to talk about uh, changing colors. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, adding in new content. Um, we're going to talk about um, uh, switching out images uh, and that sort of a thing. Because th those are generally the kinds of things that when you want to get in and you want to customize or you want to rebrand, uh, those are generally some of like the, the high priority things that you end up hitting first. And so uh, we'll, we'll start there. And so I, I want to talk a lot about um, building themes and theme variants in Domino, uh, because those are, are probably some of the first place where you'll go to make sure that your brand is appropriately represented. And so it's a, a pretty easy thing to do. We've built um, in Domino a theme already that we call the um, the Rockstar Learning Model because all of our courses are built according to the Rockstar Learning Model, which uh, includes a learn, rehearse, and perform section of the course. Um, and so we've built that, um, and uh, it's uh, it's in this same spot where you would make a new theme. And so one of the things that you just have to remember when you're dealing with Domino is that every course that you build, or at least in Flow, uh, every course that you build is going to have a particular kind of player experience. And so this is like your next button, your back button, uh, the way your uh, table contents uh, functions, et cetera. And so um, you can kind of see it here in the thumbnails. It might be a little bit small, um, but they have a number of different um, player navigation experiences that you can choose from. Um, and it affects the way that the course is laid out. The one that we have uh, chosen in particular for these courses uh, is this story view baseline. And so um, you would select that one when attempting to switch from the theme that we've built to the new one. Uh, technically, you can pick any of them. That's actually one of the cool things about this is um, the content itself is separate from the theme, it's separate from the player. And so if you were to pick uh, something entirely different, like the, the presentation player instead, um, it would just essentially kind of rearrange the content to fit within that player a little bit better, and uh, and it would just go to that. We just like the story view, and we've built our pages to fit that a little bit better. What the story view is, and, and we'll see this when we kind of get in and look at the content, is um, it's meant for like longer, taller form content, which is actually really great for uh, a mobile device because a lot of times when you have like a, a mobile phone, you're, you're gonna be looking at it like this and not like this, right? And so, um, so that longer form content in the story view is actually really, really helpful. Um, and, and so we've, we've chosen that one. So if you want to follow through, do the same kind of a thing. I think it's just set up a little bit better. The, the uh, previous and next buttons are at the top and bottom rather than kind of at a place where you go left and right for them. And it just feels a little bit more natural when you're working on mobile. So we, we've chosen that one for, for that particular reason, but really you can choose any one you want. Um, I'm actually going to cancel out of this. We're not going to do a new theme building. Um, instead, I've built this uh, one here, the uh, Rock and Fox theme uh, for the webinar. And uh, instead of actually going in and editing it, I'm going to, we're going to talk variants uh, of themes, which is um, sometimes when people come into Domino uh, and they think they're creating a new theme, they're actually creating a new variant. And so I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the differences, uh, simply that there are things that kind of happen um, that you pick first, like that uh, the player theme, um, 
that happens on a, on a theme level. And then variants are actually a little bit more simplified and allow you to um, handle, I think, probably some of the um, probably the things that you were trying to get at anyway, like colors and maybe uh, fonts and that sort of a thing. So we're actually going to make a variant instead of a brand new theme um, just to kind of show some of the differences. Uh, themes are very similar when you build them uh, to making variants, but uh, just to, again, kind of emphasize that there is a difference between creating a brand new theme and a, and a brand new variant. And the variant itself will actually end up living uh, underneath the new theme. So first of all, we want to change the theme. So we'll come in here and we'll select this Rock and Fox theme. Um, and what you're going to see, actually, let me go back. I'm going to, we're going to take a look at the course first under uh, our Rockstar Learning Model. I've created a duplicate. This is our uh, fire, fight, or flee course um, that we have available in our workplace safety um, micro learning courses. And so we'll just go ahead and hop into a page really quick, just so that way you can kind of see some of the things that are happening in there. So that way when we make the switch of, of themes, you'll see how how it gets affected and and it can kind of help you to make some better decisions when selecting color or font, et cetera. So here's the course. And so as, as I was talking about, we have kind of like these, these taller, longer pages that really when you get down into mobile, um, they, they slide very nicely into mobile um, view. They kind of just become a single column. So any of your, your two column or three column stuff just becomes a single column and very, very easy for it to scroll around. I'll show a couple of other pages just to, to show some of the, the content and again, just how the theme is applied. <clears throat> you can see some of our colors over here. It shows the colors just kind of at a glance in the thumbnail and you can see how we're using all of these different colors throughout um, the courses. So it's background colors, sometimes it's text color. Um, and some of the other things. Um, so before we change the theme, I just I just wanted to to just give this little bit of a preview here. So this is this is uh, essentially what we're dealing with. So we'll come back to this first one. Uh, and now we're going to go ahead and change the theme, so that way you can see how this is going to affect it. So what I've done is I've tried to choose a, a color palette. I am not a graphic designer. I'm just going to throw that out right now. So I'm not a graphic designer, so this is really not necessarily the best color choices, but I've tried to pick ones that are kind of similar in uh, tone to the previous one. So you'll, you can kind of see the two over here. Um, we you know try to keep light colors light and dark colors dark as we make the switch. And that's actually kind of a helpful thing to be considering where you place them um, when when switching them because uh, sometimes it can create some really nasty conflicts, which it probably will do anyway. But again, just kind of keeping that in mind as you make some of these switches over. And there we go. And so it has just applied the new theme that I created earlier, um, which included a uh, font change. It included some color changes and it, it mostly goes one for one uh, to all of the different times that we have used the font color. There have been some exceptions where we have um, used either different colors um, that are outside of the theme. And so those actually will stay put anytime you've set, uh, say, a text color uh, to be something outside of the theme. Um, it will, it remembers it and stays put. So um, let's see if I can maybe kind of give an example of that real quick. So if I come back over to this, Actually, I probably could have just made the change uh, on the other one. But anyway, we'll, we'll come back to this. And so if, if say, I wanted to give emphasis on a particular word. Um, so we'll come in here, down to the bottom here. And uh, say I wanted to, to emphasize uh, this, and we're going to turn it um, blue. Um, and so now that is blue. It's really terrible. You wouldn't want to do this for accessibility reasons, that blue on orange. But anyway, just again, again as an example. And then we, we change the theme. That word should stay blue um, because it's not the entire text box and it's not set uh, with a theme color in the way that the system expects it to be applied. Uh, so that way it will also change with the theme. So you'll notice uh, we have uh, the system in and of itself is actually pretty smart, so it knows that if it's on top of a dark color, it will try to put white text on top of a dark color. If it knows that it's on top of a lighter color, it will try to put um, black text or whatever your default color text is on top of that color. And so it's it's pretty smart, and it will flip that sometimes. So even if I were to, say, change this uh, section's background color to something lighter, let's just go ahead and change our fill to white. You'll see that it automatically just knows, hey, this is a, a different color. Um, and uh, those aren't going to work well if it's uh, you know white on white, and so it's smart enough to know that it should change to black. It's really really cool uh, that it's able to do that. But we'll we'll change this back to purple for now because that's just 
what it was. But you'll notice that that, regardless of uh, whether it was the light or the dark background, that word inside of there stayed blue. Um, and uh, it's uh, if you want things to be set as a particular theme color, rather than coming here into the format tab, selecting text, changing their color here, as you might normally do, they've actually got a style tab here that you can specifically say, I want everything in this text box to be, let's say gold uh, in this case, or, or a yellow or something like that. And then when you do that, this is the one that is actually linked with the theme. And so anytime we do a theme swap, um, it will come along with it. And so instead of that text being white or black, we will probably see that change uh, to, let's see, it's yellow here. So it'll probably change to blue when we swap back to the, uh, to the other theme. So again, the reason why I'm kind of showing how the theme works and how all of this stuff functions is to show you how stuff will react um, and kind of give you a clue into maybe some of the things that we have done uh, with it. So now you'll see that it's that blue color. And this one has maintained itself being blue even though the text around it that has been assigned by the style is either, in this case, probably set to default where the system can, can choose what it wants uh, depending on what the background color is. Uh, whereas this one will now change with the theme because we've told it that we want it to be this particular style pick. And so whatever that style pick is future uh, in the future with the theme, it will swap to that color as well. Presuming again, that you have made an appropriate choice of this color on top of that color, uh, which I haven't here, but that's that's kind of the idea behind it. And you can always switch it back to default if you need to. So um, so that's again, just kind of some of the, the, the small ideas behind what how things are gonna get affected uh, by a theme change. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about um, making the theme itself. So um, here I got the Rockstar Learning Model. We'll come over here to my Rock and Fox theme. And once it's changed, you have the option to add a new variant, which we'll do here in a moment. So this opens up the theme designer. This theme designer is, uh, is almost the same thing that you'll see anytime you're, you're creating a new theme. It's, it's got a lot of the same things in it. and uh, and so uh, here you can kind of see all of the different options that they give. We'll go through a few of them uh, really quickly. Um, so these are my branding colors. That's the thing that you see in the thumbnail right there, um, which you can click on this edit button. It'll give you the uh, exact hex color numbers. Um, it also gives you a nice color picker uh, if you would like to do it that way. Uh, I think most branding situations, everybody has like very, very precise. It must be this color, this shade, et cetera. Uh, and so you can just add that in by number if you want to. Um, let's say in this particular variant, I want that purple color to be black instead. And so we'll just go ahead and drag that down. We know that it, we just want it the, the straight black, no you know, color undertones to it or anything like that. Um, and that's the only the change that we want to make as far as colors go for this particular uh, variant on the theme. Um, the other uh, options that you have in here, just to kind of go over it a little bit, uh, these colors, this is a, a default uh, background, default text color, um, your hyperlink color, some other grayscale colors if you need them. I think some of these, if I remember correctly, yeah, are auto-generated based on where you start. Uh, this one we'll go ahead and do as well. Uh, this is how you add a font. Um, sometimes with your brands, you'll have a specific font that you want used. And in order to gain access to that, you just have to make sure that it's added. Again, Domino is an online tool, and so it's not going to be using your system fonts. So you just have to uh, upload them really quickly. And that's that's pretty easy to do. I've just downloaded some Google fonts uh, from uh, the Google font website. And in this case, I'm using the Simonetta regular font. Um, and if I wanted to change that or add that, all you have to do is you have to add a font. You can tell it to add some of the pre-built fonts that it has in there, or you can upload one. Um, I downloaded some yesterday while I was working on this. So we're gonna go for this quicksand font. We're just gonna go for the regular. And so now you'll see that this has added the quicksand regular and the Simonetta to my theme variant. And the way that you can tell it which one is the default is over here on the base font. And so over here, I've selected Simonetta Regular. So now I can just tell it Quicksand. Quicksand Regular. 
once I get out of here, you should see all of these examples change. And so now that is the new default. And the cool thing about this is, is since I have both of them in there, both of them will be available to me. So if I still wanted to use Simonetta, it would be available from the drop down when I'm selecting fonts, but it's going to come to the quicksand font now as the baseline. That's the one that it's always, like when you make a new text box, it's gonna come in as quicksand, uh, et cetera. And so that's like my new base font because I've told it that's the font family that I want it to work with. Um, so here you can get an idea of what all of the text is going to look like when it comes through. It's nice, it gives you the, the title, subtitle headings, um, example text, hyperlinks, marked up text, et cetera. Um, this is another one that we use uh, quite frequently. Uh, these are the different backgrounds and we've made them uh, associated with theme colors. It's actually pretty cool. When you enter in the same hex value as one of your theme colors from up above, um, they will say, hey, this is actually associated with the brand primary, um, or in this particular case, the uh, brand success one. Uh, and so it, it has kind of like a, a system-wide, hey, we know you've used that color before, so we're gonna make that association. So if I were to actually come up here and change, say that, uh, that brand primary color, this brown, uh, to a something else, I'm just gonna make an ever so slight change to it. We'll just click on that instead. Um, if I do that, you'll see now it's the 8E3 D07 color. Come back down here. Uh, it's actually made that, and it, doesn't, it keeps it as the brand primary. Anyway, it's a, it knows that it was a brand primary. I actually don't have the evidence of that, but it does make a change. Let me, uh, maybe let's swap the yellow to something outrageous. Let's go for a green. Actually, I like that. That's a nice color. We'll go for that one. And you can also see that one change too. And so you'll see that it automatically changed because again, it was associated with that brand color. So it's really nice if you've used it in certain places. Sometimes it makes that association like, hey, I know that hex value. We're just, you probably want to keep those the same. And it will automatically make that shift for you. Um, these backgrounds are really helpful. They're, they have them associated with introduction, content, assessment, summary. We don't use them like that. We just use them as four available different background types. And so it's just really helpful for us uh, to have the four different ones that we can swap to easily. Um, you may choose to use them as they've dictated uh, or not. It's, it's up to you. And, and I think it's just one of those things that's kind of helpful but not necessary. At least that's the way that we've uh, found it in our um, opportunities that we've been using to build. But these are your four backgrounds. I'll show you where you can find those in a second. These are all of your buttons. They have some that are um, first based off of your theme colors that are automatically generated. And then they give you six that you can customize, actually no, seven, you can customize here uh, for yourself to make them look and uh, act however you want them to. Um, so you can customize those as well. Um, these are uh, components, so things like your tab interactions, your buttons, how those are going to function. You can make edits to that if you desire. You can make edits to uh, assessments, um, like answer types and the way that like this immediate feedback uh, looks. So you can say, I want my correct color to be this, my incorrect color to be that. Here's a background color that I want you to use whenever it's got one of those little tab things. Uh, icon types if you want to specify what kind you want to do there. Um, some more accessibility options, and then uh, some options for uh, for things associated with the player. So um, in some cases, you can have uh, a home page and a course description show up at the very beginning with a, like a little start button in there. We have it turned on on this one, but on our other, our, our normal theme, we've actually turned those off so you just get straight into course content. But you can choose to do it however you like. So if you want them to kind of land on a page where it's got your logo, it's got um, a description of the course, it has kind of the, the table of contents laid, like, laid out there for the user to see, you can have that there for them. We've just chosen to jump right into the course, mostly because we've actually kind of built our own kind of specialized menu system for these courses that we've just decided not to, to use what's built in there. But you can do whatever you like. Uh, we'll leave that in there so that way you can kind of see what I'm, I'm talking about. And then you can save this. We'll call this, oh, I was gonna change the icon, Rock and Badger theme instead. Uh, just save it out. And now we have a variant that kind of lives underneath um, the, the larger Rock and Fox theme. And so we have these two. And now it's trying to make the switch of colors to the new theme. 
and our new font as well. So um, looking at this, you can suddenly see, oh goodness, we, we have a problem <laughs> because now uh, everything's on a black background and a lot of our images kind of use this almost blue black. You might even not be able to tell the difference depending on the contrast uh, of your screen right now. But we've lost some of our images because they're suddenly on black backgrounds. There's a number of different ways that you can change that. Uh, the easiest one is potentially just by changing the background type that you you uh, are using. So currently we're using this black summary background one. If I wanted to, I could change it to kind of this minty looking uh, assessment one instead, and then we get some of these back. In other places, we've forced it um, to be a part of the section fill background, and so you would just have to make sure that you find those locations and make that change as well. Um, and then that ends up solving a lot of that. So this is, again, probably the biggest, the, the main way that you're going to be handling a lot of uh, uh, I would say relevant content changes, uh, but there are probably a few other things. So before maybe we move on to some of those other items, pause, any questions, everything going great? Uh, this is this is going fantastic. Um, I think there has been uh, a couple questions here um, about our off-the-shelf. So sure. our, we should probably address some of the changes that we have made to our off-the-shelf offering in the last, sure. I don't know, six months. Yeah, so, for sure. Uh, I mean, you're our, our, our product production manager. You, you understand this the most. Right. So can you explain to us the difference between what our old off-the-shelf was and our new off-the-shelf and why we chose to go down our new off-the-shelf course? And I do want to also preface this with next week we're going to be having a webinar with Chris Willis who will be talking about the Rockstar Learning Model and more of what Tom's going to mention to us now. Yeah, so... <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, Chris is definitely going to be uh, the one to to kind of best handle uh, the details of this. But uh, to talk a little bit about what we were previously doing, we had uh, built uh, longer form courses um, in uh, a few of the other authoring tools, uh, Storyline and uh, Lectora and Captivate. And uh, those courses, um, again, they they were much larger, meant for a, a longer seat time. Um, and we decided that we wanted to kind of move to something that was a little bit more micro learning. We, we got a lot of feedback from folks that micro learning was was more kind of what their organization was looking for because they they knew that their employees didn't have, you know, even 20 minutes to necessarily sit down in front of a computer somewhere and take a course. Um, and so we said, well, let's maybe look at doing some micro learning courses and more specifically ones that can be done from anywhere, just everybody's got a mobile phone uh, these days, and so it's really, really easy to do that. And these uh, courses also can be taken on desktop if that's the desire. And so we really wanted to help uh, customers and organizations fill that need of being able to reach their their users a lot easier um, through kind of these multiple micro learning courses. And so that's that's basically the the reason why we did that. And we we looked at those other authoring tools, and they all have methods whereby you can do that, um, but they weren't quite as, they're a lot harder to build in, and they didn't really have kind of like a mobile first mindset, which is really what Domino was trying to do when they built Flow. They have a desktop authoring tool uh, called Claro, which we didn't build these in, um, because again, Flow's, uh, uh, entire purpose was again mobile first learning and so uh, we tried very very hard to make sure that anytime you're looking at one of these screens they will flow down into mobile you know pardon the pun they will flow down into mobile much easier uh, than some of the other ones we've we've dealt a lot with uh, some of the other authoring tools and the way that they handle that and usually it's either through like in the case of Lectora it's breakpoints uh, where you say at this screen size I, I have to rearrange everything and, and and put it into place so that way it looks okay on that screen size. Uh, and at this screen size, it looks like this. And it's this screen size, it's this, right? So you, you hit all of your, your different platforms. Um, Captivate has recently changed to a different way of doing things called fluid boxes, where essentially you kind of stick everything inside of a box and then it, it tries to handle that for you. But you still have to do a, a lot of finessing to get those things to work in place. Um, and then uh, Storyline doesn't really do mobile 
uh, outside of kind of like an app that they have for uh, your mobile devices. And then you, but then it's still very much like here's a desktop course on your mobile device and whatever size it is, is what you get. And like, they're not trying very hard with that. Instead, they kick people over to Rise if they want mobile content. And while we, we like Rise, we think that it can create some really great content. We wanted something that had a lot more flexibility, a lot more editability for the kinds of things that we could add in and the way that it could look. And so when we started looking at Domino and, and in particular Flow, that's why we gravitated towards it. Because as you can see, like it very much acts like a traditional authoring tool, but it has that benefit of being able to move very smoothly and with very little effort on our part as far as how we get it to, to move between those different views. Um, and we just liked that ease of being able to build and um, and kind of that mobile first mindset that you might see on something like Rise. So it's kind of it's kind of the best of all worlds and we've really grown to, to appreciate it. We've, uh, <clears throat> over the years, as we've done a lot of templates and assets, we've just determined that it's, it's really time for EOB to embrace, you know, mobile and accessible and make that a big part of the Learning yeah. Brothers ecosystem of our, our offerings, of our solutions. Right. Um, for those of you that may have seen us at DevLearn, you know, we, we are trying to, to address every potential solution for as, as far as accessing mobile and accessibility, and uh, and and I think we've we've definitely done that here yeah, yeah. with our off the shelf courses. Um, someone says, okay, I love your off the shelf, but I don't have access to Domino. Can oh, I? Yeah. Uh, deal through you guys with Domino? Absolutely. I mean, I am not a salesperson either, and I honestly don't even know what costs are because I just. <laughs> just build stuff but we can yes for sure i know that is an option um so there if i remember correctly and somebody can correct me if i'm wrong um we offer this in, in a variety of different ways so we we offer um essentially kind of just like a a published version of the course like a, a file a scorn package for you to download uh, so that way you can just stick it up as is on your LMS. No, no need to worry about editing. Um, and you just take the file, you go and you publish. Uh, another thing that we are, are currently working on is also a hosted version where essentially we have an LMS and you just um, can kind of come in, get your users in. Uh, we'll host it, keep it up there for you. Um, so if you don't have an LMS solution, this can kind of help to bridge that gap. And then what I think is the best but i'm a developer so clearly i think this is the best is is you just essentially get a license of domino we can get you set up with that uh, along with the courses they have um what's called the dlc library and i can just kind of show that really quick um when uh it's it's this and so basically um you can get uh buy like courses from folks uh and have them available to you to edit um, in your version of uh, Domino One. And so uh, Domino One, again, being kind of their, their big blanket thing, because it's all cloud-based stuff, so you can have access to, to Claro if you get that, you can have access to Flow authoring tool if you get that. Um, anyway, and then if you buy these DLC uh, content pieces, of which our courses are some, um, then you can just essentially pull those in, edit them, do whatever you want with them. And that's that's definitely something that we can uh, hook you up with. And I like that the most because I just, I'm a control person. And uh, I just like being able to get in there and say, no, I wanted to do this. So yeah, we can definitely get you set up with that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, one other <clears throat> question has come in about what you were showing us uh, sure. in the tool. Yeah. Um, when you change the fonts, mm -hmm. uh, are the containers sized appropriately after that? Are they that done automatically? Do I need to take care of that myself? Absolutely. So this is one of the glories. And so this almost even kind of segues into, into one of the things that I'm talking about. So I'll, I'll show it here uh, because this, this feels like a really good opportunity. So the way that you build content in Flow um, is uh, through what they call... Let me change this. So essentially, Domino Flow courses and, and, and content are built in, in what they refer to as like a Russian nesting doll type system. And so if I click on this image, you'll, you'll see it. There's kind of a breadcrumb up here telling you all of the pieces that it's inside. So here we have our warning sign. It's our image. Uh, the warning sign is in a group, which is one of the three columns in this. Then there's a row which has all of the three different groups, and you can see how we've built that. So it's essentially two pieces on the on the left half, and then one text piece on the right half. And then you go one step up from that, and it's your section. So this is, for instance, where like our background color lives. So if I wanted to be black or brown or this uh, kind of 
green color, um, that would be where that lives. And then you have your page, your entire page. And so um, it, it's all of these pieces and they kind of live inside of each other. And, and they've made it so that way anytime you want um, a new uh, section, basically um, you can just say, I want a section that is one column, one single column or I want a section that's two columns. And they give you a few different options for how that two column will break out. So whether it's gonna be kind of like a one quarter piece, a one third piece, a one half piece, this, they do the same thing for three column and then four column. And so those are kind of like your options for kind of where you will start. Uh, and so say for instance, I add this uh, four column piece. Um, so now I have uh, four columns. Each of these are different elements and different groups because um, uh, of that and then they ha they all live in a row and then they all have a section so that's again kind of going back on all of these pieces and so if if in this particular section I just say here's some test text um, and I get my breadcrumb and if even within the same section I want something now that's only two columns I can still add another row and I can say okay now I want this to be let's I, I call this the one-third two-third um, and this is now still living within that same section. So I have a four column something and a two column something. And then it's smart enough and it just knows how to make these things resize appropriately. And so what you end up having is control over the width, but not the height of something. Uh, because anytime it comes down to mobile, it will just put it into the height that it needs uh, every single time. So if you have different fonts, which kind of coming back to the different uh, to the question again, if I have a different font and it's obviously at a very different sizing for the same point font than another one is, what it will do is it will just essentially push down the space that it needs and it will keep the width at what you told it. Um, so the width will always stay the same um, and then it knows because I've got this amount of fixed width, anytime I uh, need more than that, I've got to move things around. I've got to flow it down uh, into this single column format. And so it, it can kind of do that. Uh, for you. And so that's that's the way that it ends up being. So mobile view often ends up just being kind of single column row stuff all the times. Um, but it uh, on desktop, then you have these these nice column breakouts. And so when you're building, you have to kind of think about that and how that's going to affect things. Um, yeah, so just always remember that it will it will kind of move down often into a single column. Does that make sense? Hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, it looks like I did answer the question. <laughs> um, we can we can continue on and come back to a couple questions uh, right at the end, unless. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, just kind of continuing on about this, uh, essentially the question of, well, what if I want to add new content? So this is primarily the way that you'll do it, where you'll add new sections in. There's a few different options that come with it when whenever you want to add a section. What I did was called uh, add a blank row or really add a blank section. If you click on add a section, Domino is giving you a ton of templates like pre-built templates that have cool layouts that you can use uh, immediately. Uh, some of them also uh, have uh, like theme bits in them so like images so if you're you're into that sort of a thing you can it's got like nice placeholders essentially for you uh, so that way you can say, oh, I like the fact that this is a heading plus, you know, kind of left text, right image, then left image, right text, that kind of a thing. And so if, if you see something that you like out of one of their templates, you can just throw that in without too much of, a, of an issue. We like to always build the blank stuff because we just, again, want to have more control um, over it. And so we'll always use this at a blank row. But I mean, you can use how you like. And then they've just recently, they've kind of had this before, but this is a lot easier to get to now. Um, they've just recently added um, add project content or add baseline content. Baselines are essentially templates that you build and then designate as uh, a baseline. So uh, in our case, if we have a uh, baseline content that we want to use, I can pull that up. It's specifically going to go to our baselines. So if I want to say hey, I want to add this timeline that we have in our interactions and layouts baseline that we use pretty commonly. I can say, okay, I want to insert that. It gives you a nice little preview of what's going to come in. So I'm actually going to get two bits of timelines because there are two timelines on this page, but it's going to take it and insert it directly into the course. And you'll see both of those timeline pieces come in. They've been skinned, essentially themed uh, according to the background colors that we have, but now I have both of those in there. And if I don't want one, you can just say, okay, this section that just got added, let's just go ahead and delete that out because I really only wanted that first one. And now 
I've just got that first one in here. And I can then from there change background colors if I want. And there we have it. And so that's another really handy way. So if uh, it also works for project content. So instead of just baselines, if you say, man, I built a, I built a course like two months ago where it had this really cool thing that I think I could just kind of pull over and switch out the content and it'll work right in here. And so then you can um, just pull in from a project and you can just say, okay, uh, I want to look for something in my creations. And then essentially exactly in the same way uh, as you did before with the uh, with the baseline, you can just say, oh, okay, so here's uh, this you need to know page from this other course. And it's got that section in there that I want. And I can just in, essentially insert that entire page in, delete out the pieces I don't want or keep everything that I do want. So for instance, if I wanted that, uh, this timeline bit, but not the other ones. I could insert the entire page, delete out these other bits, and then have that in there. There are also some other ways where you can just essentially copy out only a section, uh, but they're they're a little bit uh, longer to uh, accomplish. But anyway, it's it's got really, really easy ways that you can either take stuff from your own projects, start from a blank, uh, start from a template they have, uh, and get going with, with brand new content. And so that's basically how you would add uh, add things in. Excellent. Uh, one other question here, uh, coming back to those text boxes, if you're working on localization and you're not mm -hmm. sure how different languages will roll, um, is that, I mean, what you showed us before, is that kind of how you would figure that out? Yeah, yeah. So they definitely have some things that you can do uh, as far as translation. We haven't actually worked too much with translation in Domino, but they are very aware of it. And I know that they've got um, some ways that you can uh, handle doing that. So um, they do have uh, these options where you can essentially export, import your translation files. But again, as far as like how um, the text is gonna land on the page, it's the same way as like a font change almost um, because obviously words are different sizes. And so um, let me just show you what's gonna happen. So if I take this and uh, I just paste this like a few different times, you'll see that it's getting longer and longer there. But I have this row centered, so what's gonna happen? After I click out, it just forces it back into being a centered row. And so that's kind of the similar thing that you'll notice is it just takes the space that it needs in the section um, and then just says, okay, well, I need more now. And so I'm just gonna stretch it out um, to, to appropriately fill whatever it is I need. Because again, your widths are fixed, but your height is flexible. Um, which is good because again, when it goes down into mobile, it's just a little bit more scrolling that it has to do. So it'll wrap words around as it needs to. This might be problematic with some languages because not all languages are um, easy to go from uh, English into their appropriate language. And you know, perhaps they just function a little bit differently. So it's, it's probably something that you'll just have to take a look at, but it should still kind of smartly size itself appropriately again, because you're fixed width, height flex flexible. And so it'll just push it out however much more it needs. And there are a lot of things that you can do to kind of adjust with that if you need to, but um, it's usually just pretty smart about handling it. And then uh, when you get down again into mobile, it's just, it's all single column anyway. And so uh, it will take up the height that it needs to take um, without too much problem. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions at this time. Cool. Um, is there anything else you'd like to tell us or brag about with our off-the-shelf courses that <laughs> sure. you've been working well, for months on? Yeah, so I mean, again, it's very easy to, to make changes to things. So swapping images, they just give you very, very quick buttons to do that if you'd like to. Um, when it comes to actions, we don't tend to use a ton of actions uh, in these uh, because Honestly, for the most part, a lot of their elements that they have pre-built in handle a lot of those kinds of things. So if you're used to making a tabbed interaction where you have to tell it when you click on this, do this, they've got a ton of things that are already pre-built and handle that for you. So generally actions, we don't have to build them in order to actually do interactions. So they've got uh, accordions, which are really cool. They've got tab sets in there, carousels. Again, all of this stuff is like pre-built and we just use the pre-built stuff because it functions really great and you don't have to build it all by yourself if you don't want to. Um, so I would suggest highly for doing that, but if you do, um, they've got a really great um, actions uh, setup where you can kind of come over here to this actions pane, you can see all of the actions that are going on. A lot of our actions actually have to do with the narration that is provided uh, in the course. Um, and in some cases it has to do with uh, 
these little inline questions, kind of knowledge check things that we build right out at the start. Um, and it's very, very simple. Um, all you have to do is just kind of come in, you can click on uh, the items. In this particular case, this is when the final attempt is incorrect on this. Um, here's the, the pop-up that it's going to show for feedback. Here's the background of the pop-up. Um, fading if you want it, conditions if you want to set conditions on it. It's very, very simple to do that sort of a thing um, and, and to make changes to that if you need to. Um, if you need to insert a new something, so say you have a button or if I wanted to turn this image into a button for some reason, um, you can do that. They've got this uh, triggers. You can say when the selected element is interacted with. So for instance, when it's clicked, you can do something to it when it's loaded on the timeline. Um, you can maybe make a change to it if a variable changes that you've set up. There's a lot of different ways that you can handle this. Um, and they make it very, very easy. They've got kind of like a wizard where you can, you can build it and say, okay, well, when this image gets clicked, I want to show another element that's perhaps hidden on the page. And then you can tell it to do that. And it has all of that uh, stuff in there. So it's a very, very kind of like uh, like wizard building for actions. Very easy to use uh, if you're used to other authoring tools. Very intuitive to pick up. Um, and and that's pretty much it. I mean, like for the most part, that is I think going to cover 90% of what you're going to need to do if you're ever going to come in and edit one of these courses. They're very, very neat. Um, it's also probably worth mentioning the cool accessibility features that are available. Um, that's just this little guy right here on uh, the ribbon. Um, so if you're on an element and you want it to be focusable by a screen reader, you can click on it and it normally comes default that way. We've turned off a lot of our images because they're kind of just extra. They're not um, really needed all of the time. And so uh, unless it's uh, an image, for instance, like this one where we did make it focusable because we want it's it's telling a story. And we want to make sure that the uh, that somebody who needs a screen reader is able to understand what's going on there. And so. Uh, it has that. It has some really cool hints over here on things that you can do. These are screen reader texts. It has a, a place for um, alt text. They're really, really focused on trying to make that as easy for you to edit and uh, insert that kind of a thing as possible. And so it's on a per element basis. Yeah, and and that's I think really it. I mean, again, our our biggest uh, advantage with this particular tool is is going for mobile first content that's also accessibility ready. And they've got a real big eye on that. They try to build all of those um, interactive elements uh, with accessibility in mind uh, as much as they possibly as much as they possibly can. And so it's made it really really easy for us to include those kinds of things and say that while it may not necessarily meet your brand's needs, we have tried to get you as close as we can there uh, before you can take over and say, well, actually, we need it to go this far, or it didn't even need to go that far. Maybe we did cover you. So, um, But it, it's it's really, really helpful and, and, and does a lot to make sure that you can get what you want out of that if something like uh, 508 is something that your organization needs. Excellent. Thank you again, Tom. I'm going to steal the screen back from you. Is that okay? I suppose so. <laughs> okay, so I will grab that and uh, put this up. Let's make sure it's showing you the right thing. Okay, so like we were saying, um, this this has been a session where we've talked about how you can easily edit, customize the off-the-shelf training that, uh, that we sell. We have an enormous library, several of them. We've also... Uh, I mean, we've been collecting and building these courses for the last several months, and now we have a ton to offer for safety to cybersecurity to, uh, you know, other soft skills and, and general things that are just good to know and that many companies are going to require that you uh, have. Lots of OSHA requirements are being met as in our, our courses. So we would love to show you those, and now you know that, you know, they're off the shelf, sure, but you can absolutely edit them to mm -hmm. make them whatever you need them to be. Yeah. Um, to get a demo and know about those, that number there on the screen, 801-796-2767. And as always, you can send us an email at info at elearningbrothers.com or just visit elearningbrothers.com. And we've got an off-the-shelf section there at the top ribbon of our webpage that will answer a lot of your questions and so, show you some of these libraries and what we've got to offer. Now, if you are still just building your own courses and you still want some awesome assets, you can grab 10 of them for free through our seven-day free trial. So you can grab that there also at eLearningBrothers.com. Thank you so much, Thomas. It's been very, very useful. Thanks, everybody, yeah. for joining us. And if you'd like to learn more about our Rockstar Learning Model or more about these uh, off-the-shelf courses, we've got a webinar coming up a week from today. 
on the 14th, and then we'll be doing another webinar also about these off-the-shelf courses the week after that, which is the week before Thanksgiving here in the States. So uh, we hope you guys will join us for those, and thanks again. We'll see you next time. See ya. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.